you very much. I mean, who is this guy standing up here? Let me just move on a little bit because I really like Sanjian. Oh, what's that a sheep? I should go back, excuse me. This is all about partnering. It's about an ecosystem. I mean, you'll all be aware of the San Francisco and the Valley. They have a great ecosystem. VCs, tech companies that grow up over a hundred billion dollars. Now, in my case, as we were just uh, introduced, in my career, I've started up well over a hundred by partnering and having fun doing it. I was actually brought up in Wales, and I'll bring that up because I took full advantage. And I know what you're thinking, sheep. But it's true. I mean, I might do well in sheep farming. There's certainly a lot of them. And I think in the today environment, there might actually be a good application for sheep farmers. But in any event, I took full advantage of certain times in life. When there's change, there are generally opportunities. Imagine if you're a large company with many layers of management and you have lots of clients potentially all over the world. And to make a decision, it takes a long time. In fact, anyone that runs a company, you'll see every year there's a board. The board will see a budget. In the budget, there'll be all kinds of line items and the budget will be approved. Well, of course, anyone that's run a company or a or a government will find, well, there's a budget, and you live within the budget. And sometimes, the larger the organization, the slower it is to take advantage of a change. It's when there's change that you can take advantage and grow a business. And I've become kind of a master at that. So imagine you have a big company, you might be the CEO, or board member, or whatever, and clients want new things but they might want new things on what you already sell. And certainly in the today environment, that is the case. So there's what I call above the line and below the line. Above the line is what you have to do to maintain the clients. They have demands. The salespeople say, well, we need to do this. There'll be a new release, and on and on and on. And you know you have to do that to maintain the clients. The key is if you can get your hands on it, is the stuff below the line. That's what you like to do, but it's a bit more speculative, but you don't have the budget to do it. And there's multiple layers to get decisions made. So if I took you back in time, why was, able, why was I able to do what I do? Start up and make successful companies. And as we just uh, heard, some of them have been incredibly successful. And what was I doing in Canada? I came here for a holiday. And if I go back in time, well, let's think about that. I came from Wales. Think coal. Think steel. Think things that are made from steel. Bridges and so on. Around me was an ecosystem. That the biggest layer of anthracite coal in the world came from where I was brought up. A massive ecosystem, because anthracite makes coke. Coke is the fuel to make steel. You need iron ore. Iron ore was in the area. So many of the early inventions to make steel, iron, copper, tin, zinc, and all metals that come from that, like brass, came from that area. That was around me when I was brought up. And I noticed that. And when you have a factory that makes steel, or a coal mill, or whatever, or a coal pit, well then there's all kinds of suppliers. Plumbers, electricians, communications, welders, like it goes on and on and on and on. That was the scene that I was brought up in. And I was imaginative. I always tried things, I like trying things. And if it works, well I do it again. And I grow on it. I increment it. And I've done this many times in my life. At 15, I was chosen by the BT R&D department at 15 to join the R&D department in Wiles. A hot WD, three-stroke one. Radio wave development. 
Good God, new forms of microwave dishes, not cable, but microwave. New forms of using wireless, even millimeter wavelength, the kind of thing that a klystron would roast your testicles or your eyeballs. So I knew exactly, more and more, it's kind of in your gut as to what you get out of wireless. And today, what do we, we've already heard about it, like 5G. What does 5G bring you? Smaller cells. I can remember, I think it was about 1980, I had a mobile phone. It was in a leather case. Most of that was a battery. And I'd have one of four channels I could pick. And you found out which one to pick by connecting and someone's already on it. Then you'd select another one and hope it's free. Well, okay, I mean, that was 1980. Is it really that long ago? But the truth is, I know wireless. I came to Canada from Wales. I was offered a job at what was Microsystems International. It's gone now. Canada's big semiconductor company. I didn't actually come looking for a job, but because of my telecom experience, which was almost 10 years, even then, it was starting up part of what was BNR, but being changed. They offered me a job. It was triple the salary. Ooh, I mean, if it was 10 or 20%, thanks for the offer, but I'm actually not doing too badly back home. They offered me a salary that was tripling. I took it. I became the person that went around the world putting on presentations to talk about the, in the telecom industry how you use the chips. Now that took me to Singapore for the first time, Hong Kong, Jakarta. Now I, I was already pretty well traveled because I did quite well in terms of a salary out of BT. I traveled all around the world talking to telecom companies, made tons of friends. But somehow or other I didn't like the direction the company was following. I worked hard because for me it's almost like a hobby. I enjoy what I do. So I put copious notes together as to the direction the company should follow. They ignored it. So I say, okay, I'm not needed then. So I left with a guy called Mike Copeland. I borrowed four thousand dollars from the Bank of Nova Scotia and I started up my tell. Nineteen seventy two. Now, why am I describing that to you? Because there was nothing around here. How did that company do? An interesting thing. I didn't have money to employ people. So I learned an incredible lesson in life. Ownership. If you don't have money to pay people, give them ownership. Mitel was probably the first company in Canada maybe in North America, to give people ownership with an agreement called stock options. The crazy thing about that company, 10 years later, every $1 share was converted to two and a half million. Nobody complained about not being paid in the first six months. But we worked around the clock. I'm using the little formula of listening to clients. So the golden rules for me, listen to clients, hear what the clients have to say, and guess what? If you actually build what they ask for, they'll buy it. Well, there's a surprise I would never have guessed. And here's the next thing. The bigger a company is, the longer it will take to get what clients are asking for because they have budgets above the line. And that typically consumes all the budget. There's very little speculative money left. I was the speculator, listening to clients, delivering what they say, and boom. My turn was the first company to make a software-driven PBX. Brand new, nobody thought you could do it. It became global because you could change dial tones, busy tones, conditions on the trunks, on and on and on through software. What unbelievable growth. Now, some of you, I mean, it was a little bit of a laugh. The first year was a stub year. We did $252,000. The second year was no joke. We did 1.5. Third year, 5.4. Then 11. Then 22. Then 44. Then 112. The company, in about 1982, had shares of $58 a share with 
$1.4 billion, 1983. Not bad, not bad. And the message today, you can see the company's changed a lot. This was the first uh, Mitel console for a PBX. But the world is changing. And in the mid-80s, it was changing dramatically. So I started up a company called, what was the company called? Datacom. Because I believed in data communications. Unbelievable, $80,000 invested. That company did 70 to $80 million a year for over 20 years. And the gross margin was over 80%. Mitel acquired it in the second year. If I'd have known it was going to grow so quick, I don't think I'd have sold it. But what a hell of a company to do that. Then there was Newbridge. Now, what an experience that was. 1986. By 2000, it was worth $10.7 billion. The growth was ferocious. Same basic formula. Listen to clients. In this particular case, digital data networks. The company doubled down, worked incredibly hard. Ownership. Many, many people became millionaires because of Newbridge. But there's another side to that. I deliberately had a DNA to partner back to an ecosystem. Newbridge created over 50 companies. All but two were successful. Many of them are still around in one form or another. Because below the line, you don't actually have the money to do the development that you'd like to do, but you don't have the budget to do it. Fine, let someone else do it. And they become a partner. So you'll see companies like Dragonway, companies like March Networks, companies that were in security systems. Very, very important. I did one more thing in my tell, which is a little bit of a golden rule, back to Wales. I knew lots of people in Wales. So Wales became, because I knew lots of people, became the European headquarters of my tell. Became the European headquarters for Newbridge, an hour and a half west of London. And in the US, I started up in the first year in my tell, with virtually no money, I started up the U.S. group, and that was in the Washington area. Why the Washington area? Well, because in Washington, the U.S. government is the biggest buyer of services and equipment on the planet. Be next to your big client. Does that make sense? Makes sense to me. So my tell and Newbridge, boom. Headquarters in the U.S., right next door to the biggest client. And did it ever make a difference for the company? There was one other little golden rule that almost nobody follows, and I just don't understand it. When I was brought up in Wales, I thought Singer was a British company. I thought Hoover was a British company. So the person that worked in Mitel in 1983 had a card that said Managing Director Mitel. It didn't say Vice President of Sales said managing director. No, the guy didn't actually run the company, but with that title, you can open up, open up any doors. And the person in the US, President Mitel, wasn't Vice President Sales, Mitel from Canada. Didn't say that. That allows you to open up all kinds of doors. There's an old formula in life. You only get one shot first impression. Now an interesting thing is anyone in real estate will call it curb appeal. It may be actually the best house or the best building in the whole area for you to buy. If it looks bad, you don't even get out of the car to go in. It might be the best value, the best property, but it doesn't have curb appeal. You get one shot, one shot, first appearance. So how do you appear? How do you play it up? It's called marketing in another way. Now why are we here today? Why Sengen? Why do I support Rich? Why do I really like the timing? Because in our society we have the manpower, the brain power, 
to go into a brand new time in the entire planet. We all have mobile phones. Rich talked about the fact he was a little fed up with the size of his broadband at home, and yet he lives in the Ottawa area. You see, the truth of the matter is we all have mobile phones. We all expect to browse the network. We all expect to search the networks. We all expect to occasionally take a video of something, pass it to 20 friends, and expect it to go. We've come to expect that. Some people have come to expect that they can take a machine and look at someone else and actually have a video collaboration session or stretch it a bit further and add someone else. They might be in Tokyo, they might be in the UK or France. And you, you might say, well, I'd like to show you, I'd like to show you this presentation. And there's more than another person on it. We've come to expect that. Like, video is a massive bandwidth hog. And just like, in most people here will remember the history. How long ago, when I had a briefcase almost all batteries, to run a mobile phone. Because it was important to me. I had clients all over the world. How long ago? How long ago that we'd have to dial up to connect a modem to connect to the internet? It wasn't fit for purpose. Like it just, it doesn't suit the society. Neither did it suit Canada to have a job in Ottawa and have to go down a dirt road called Corkstown 30 years ago. What was, what was it, Jim? 40 years ago? 40, I'm sorry, it was 40 years ago, but it wasn't fit for purpose. In fact, we built a highway called 417, and it's probably, I would say, 30 years now since it was widened, maybe 20 years, Jim, something like that. And it's still not fit for, for purpose. As soon as you get off Eagleson, there's a queue, and that might be 7 o'clock in the morning, 8 o'clock in the morning, 9 o'clock, it takes an hour to get downtown. It has to change. So what have we got? New transit way coming in. So sometimes things just not fit for purpose for what the people want. And if you look at the change in mobile, here's the great thing about mobile. You don't need to dig up the roads to make that last connection, which is where the bulk of the connections are. And so in this society, I happen to have visibility of a huge number of companies in the society working down a direction of 4 plus and 5G, where the last connection is broadband, and it's wireless. You don't have to dig up the roads. And then, how are you going to deliver that? Well, it's small cells. It's not the big cell that we have today. It's small cells that are wireless. And it'll probably be part of road lighting. The road lighting has ducting. It has power. They're very regular. Belongs to the city. The city becomes much more important than it ever did before. And the return to the city is all kinds of connectivity for information that today the city doesn't have. And it isn't just Ottawa. It's the entire planet. There are much more efficient ways of doing so many things. It's like a candy store. You can almost get into any area, even sheep farming, and find that you can, you can actually grow sheep better through some new, new solutions and using networks. It's a very interesting world we're living in. So 5G. This is no longer something like a 3G to 4G. Some of you will have a phone and it says 4G. Or you might have some fixed device that's still wireless and it say 4G. And that was about a tripling of the throughput from 3G. So if you own Spectrum, like a Telus or a Rogers, what would you do? You'd move to get more Spectrum throughput, and then you'd get to more Spectrum. 
But when you go to 5G, it's not a one, two, three times. It's a thousand times increase. Because if we were all using video collaboration, you need one hell of a lot of bandwidth. And if you like movies delivered on demand, you're going to need a lot of bandwidth. So it isn't necessarily fiber to every home, because many things just are not fiber connected. And the dramatic cutting costs will be wireless. So what's Rich promoting? He's promoting that we all work together and go down a wireless route and a, an optic route. Something has to feed this extra bandwidth. And working down a cloud environment. Now what's Michael doing? So but here's an interesting one. Look, look at this. I mean, this tells you, if I go back a little bit, look at this, the world is changing. But it's changing more rapidly right now than it has for probably a couple of decades. You may not be aware of it. Because I'm involved in 70 different companies in tech, and they're around the world, I get unbelievable feedback, not just reading magazines, hearing what clients want. This is a big thing for me. And by the way, Mitel is really working hard to capture this change through partnering. So here we go. Look at this. Moving to digital transformation. What the hell does that mean? Well, here's an interesting little chart that you might like. Look at the changes just in the last few years and where it's expected to go. Look at client experience. You don't want to make things complicated. It has to be easy for the clients. It has to be easy to connect things. Look at that. Cost has gone way down. Not so much about what is the cost of doing something. What do you get out of it? Incredibly important. And we concentrate that. Look at this. How many people think about an operating system being the cloud? Do you know how much the cloud grew last year and those that are into it? Amazon Web Services, not a little company. It tripled last year. And here's the interesting <laughs> thing. The company tripled revenues after cutting the selling price by two to one because of competition. So the actual output of the company went up by six to one. What does that tell you? Good God, is there ever a change going on? And microservices, a shift of microservices. All kinds of new things you can do, like a candy store. Which candy did you want? Because it's full of everything. It literally could even be sheep farming. Honest to God. That is the sort of changes going on. Now in this area, I am very active pulling people together. I have this little philosophy that goes a bit like this, and some people don't get it, you know. Here's a right hand. Look at that, it's a hand. Oh, well, well, there's another hand. It must be competitive. Well, it actually isn't competitive. You put it together, and one and one is definitely much bigger than two. So I have this DNA that says better to share and get a part of something successful than 100% of something that isn't successful. You would not believe how many tech companies I work with, and I ask incredibly simple questions. Simple questions are the best to understand. We heard that there's about 1,700 tech companies in Ottawa. I meet many of them, and I say, well, what business did you do in India last quarter? 99% will say, well, we didn't do any business in India. And I say, well, like this 1.3 billion people that would like to buy your product. Well, well, we don't do business in India. They speak English. It's 1.3 billion. Clunko. What business do you do in China? Oh, well, they speak a different language. Clunko. I'll take it even closer to home. How many of the companies do business in the UK? Like, <laughs> there's a flight directly from Ottawa to London. There's three flights a day from Toronto. 
what hope? Let's go back in time. I borrowed $4,000. You can't pay people with $4,000. And yet, I had somebody running the company in the UK and somebody running the company in the US. How can you do that? Sharing. Partnering. What I like about Sanjay is at the heart of the company, at the heart of the activity, is sharing, is partnering, is creating an ecosystem. We can all win with. Get on it. Thanks a lot.